Good morning and welcome to another edition of The Balanced Perspective with me, Mansur Naka of Naked Investments. And as usual, we're joined by Ian Power of Truffle Asset Management. Good morning and welcome, Ian. Morning, Mansur, and morning to everyone joining us on the call. Today's topic, hitting the ceiling. That, of course, referring to the U.S. debt ceiling. Ian, if investors didn't have enough to continue with, given everything we've seen so far in the markets, another issue that is coming sharply into focus is, of course, the debate around the debt ceiling or limit in the U.S., the debt ceiling, of course, being the total amount of debt that can be taken on by the U.S. government. Recently, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has commented that the U.S. could potentially run out of cash as soon as June 1st, warning, and I quote, catastrophic consequences for the U.S. economy. Thus far, though, markets seem to be taking the debate in its stride with little reaction. Ian, is this, is this another source of volatility that investors should be watching out for? And, sir, I think... Um you're right. I think, you know, every year they sort of go through this uh, process in terms of their debt uh, limit. And I think one needs to sort of stand back, I guess, and get a bit of uh, perspective in terms of what we're talking about. And I think from a U.S. regulatory point of view, I think it was in the early 1900s, 1917, where they set a statutory limit in terms of U.S. debt. And that if they want to exceed this, they need to go through a process through Congress to get permission to increase it. Now, interestingly, um, I think they've increased the limit 100 times. So that gives you a sense of, uh, you know, really they've been gearing their balance sheet for the last, uh, I guess, 100 odd years. And, uh, you know, we now we're facing exactly the same situation today. So I think the U.S. debt limit today sits at about 31.4 trillion. And that's on a $26 trillion uh, economy. So significant debt well in excess of 100% of GDP. And uh, the bottom line here is that the government is uh, spending uh, more than it's getting in in terms of its re uh, tax receipts. And hence that big deficit, which is the amount that they need to go to the public sector every year to borrow, is the amount which is in question. So the issue here is if Congress doesn't agree between Democrats and Republicans, then effectively you've got a lot of people's salaries and government expenses which can't be paid. And uh, if we look back in history, there have been some periods where uh, there wasn't agreement and effectively you had shutdowns for you know up to three months, which typically had pretty negative consequences for the economy. And uh, you know I think how everything is stacked up right now, uh, you know, the market is certainly taking it in its stride and expecting an agreement between Democrats and Republicans. I think if that wasn't or if it's not reached, yeah, we could be in for a big bout of uh, volatility. You're right, Ian. I think I actually have a stat on that. I think since 1960, uh, Congress has either, ra has either raised or suspended the cap about 78 times. So the keep seems to be kicking down, you know, the ball down the line. And with Congress... Well, the U.S. Congress currently split along party lines, the Republicans, of course, controlling the lower house, Democrats controlling the Senate. Uh, given the state of U.S. politics and the increased level of polarization, um, there's probably a range of outcomes that could be gamed. What are, this, what are the scenarios that you see playing out here? Well, I think there's, um, at the moment, what we've got is we've obviously got Democrats wanting to get uh, you know, the debt ceiling raised and be able to continue to fund all of their projects and uh, the various initiatives. And I guess Republicans wanting some line in the sand uh, as to, you know, when they will start to get the government finances, I guess, in a position where the gap between what they're getting in tax receipts and what they're spending starts to close. And I think that really is, uh, you know, one of the big issues here. So my sense is that, you know, from a political point of view, we're going into election next year. I think the, you know, the Democrats would love to see the Republicans being the bad uh, actors here and walking out and then being able to point fingers to the Republicans saying, listen, you know, they, they didn't agree to, to uh, raise the ceiling and hence now we're taking pain. Um, so I think this is this is probably going to be a might be a little bit protracted, but you know my sense is there's um, obviously at the end of the day we're going to see the can being kicked down the road again. So I would think there will be an agreement. It's just a question of when and uh, how long it takes. But uh, you know markets are certainly 
priced for perfection. Um, and investors don't really seem to be worrying about the potential of, uh, you know, an economic shutdown. So I think complacency, you know, pretty high, uh, the VIX pretty low, um, and investors really expecting, you know, both uh, Democrats and Republicans to take a big swing and kick that can far down the road. While a full default by the US government is probably a low probability event, the market, of course, doesn't like uncertainty. Coming back to some of those economic consequences that Yellen was speaking about, in your view, what would this mean for the economy and some of the asset classes in case of a protracted standoff? If we just look at 2011, for instance, I think that was when the US came closest to a breach, the S&P back then fell around 17%. Uh, what, would, what would this mean for sort of the major asset classes then? Yeah, look, I mean, it would be pretty negative, And I think the bottom line means then that the government would not be able to fund it, its expenses. So, you know, typically we'd probably see quite a sharp kick in terms of long rates. And that would have uh, an impact across all the other rates, given that that's sort of the, the risk-free or the discount rate. And, uh, you know, it would bring the prospect forward of quite a sharp uh, economic slowdown. And I mean, you know, sort of uh, estimates are anywhere up to 5 6% of GDP if things are protracted. But I mean, I think the uh, actors on both sides, Republican, Democrats, you know, they'll, they'll long before that happens, they'll reach some sort of consensus. But I think the risk uh, this time around is that we've got an election coming up and, uh, you know, one of the sides or both sides may want to gain some sort of electioneering uh, credits uh, ahead of that. So I think it would be pretty negative. And, you know, also, man, so if one just steps back and, and looks at the fact that we've had rates that have moved from zero to 5% in the U.S. in just over a year, I mean, that's an unprecedented move. So significant tightening in addition to the regional banking crisis, which is putting more uh, liquidity tightening into that market. And I think if you had this sort of shutdown or, or, or you know, potential where they've got to furlough hundreds of thousands of U.S. Uh, government workers uh, to the extent that they can't pay them, I think, you know, would uh, would have pretty, pretty negative outcome in terms of uh, asset class returns. I think perversely, to your point, could this actually work then in the Fed's favor in terms of actually looking for a slowdown, trying to bring, bring down inflation? But on the other hand, you know, without getting into the mechanics of U.S. printing more money, is, is this actually then inflationary? Yeah, look, I mean, I think I think if we sort of step back and, and think about the Fed, I mean, the Fed just wants to really control inflation um, and ensure sort of uh, employment. Those are its two mandates. And I think at the moment, you know, monetary policy is a, a lagging indicator. So we're really only likely to see the full impact of what we've seen in terms of tightening hitting us by the third quarter. So sort of September, October. And I think we're going to see perhaps by that time quite quite sharp slowdown. Um, in addition to the, the sort of the banking stress, which is uh, probably tightening lending even further. So I think from that perspective, the Fed... Uh, will be feeling uh, a little bit better in the fact that inflation is starting to trend down. Um, you know, where it lands up, of course, you know, we don't know if it's going to hit the Fed fund target of uh, the 2% band. But I think, you know, that, that certainly would be uh, something positive. I think if we saw a very sharp uh, or if we saw a sharp recession, um, and we see long rates kick up and we see lots of these uh, bubbles which have been formed in housing uh, in some of the long duration um, equity markets uh, sectors um, and certainly also in some of the fixed income spaces. If we saw those pop, that would be deflationary in the short term. Uh, that would be, you know, typically when bubbles burst, that's associated with uh, quite strong disinflation. Um, but I think, you know, the, the Fed at the moment wants to ensure that that very strong labor market where you're seeing wage growth, you know, in excess of four and a half percent starts to trend down closer towards their long term target. So, yeah, I mean, if we did see a sharp contraction in asset prices, that would be disinflationary. Uh, and I think, you know, already the Fed is uh, feeling a little bit more comfortable with the fact that things will slow and they can see inflation trending down in the short term. So, you know, I would say from their perspective, no one would want to see that, uh, some big impasse that's protracted. 
uh, and that causes you know serious damage to the economy. Ian, you have a degree of protection on against the S&P declining. At least we know investors in the balance fund, you know, they can sleep a bit easier given uh, the way you and the team are actually managing the fund. Yeah, I mean, sir, that's right. Look, we've been very de defensively positioned this year. Uh, we don't think it's a time to be taking a lot of risk. We think from a risk return perspective, it's not paying investors to take a lot of risk out there given where valuations, particularly offshore and in the US, uh, are, are looking fairly expensive. And I think, you know, just highlighting the fact, as you've said again, um, you know, the the from a, a sort of a risk point of view, there are quite a lot of risks out there, notwithstanding just tightening rates, which we've seen over the last uh, 12 months, but, you know, other risks which could upset uh, what is already, already quite an expensive uh, a market in the US and where, you know, many of these big monster stocks, which make up, you know, probably close to a quarter of the S&P are almost hitting their, their historic highs. And that's notwithstanding, a, you know, a sharp earning slowdown, which you're starting to see come through that market. And we think that that will probably accelerate uh, as we walk into the next two quarters. So I think, uh, I think the risks are increasing. Ian, thanks so much for your time as always giving us lots to think about. Till next time, bye-bye. Thanks, Mansur, and thanks to everyone who joined us this morning.